Hello, welcome to the sixth video in a series of videos on systems thinking. My name is Bhaskaran and I'm the faculty walking you through this series. In this video, we are going to be talking about the importance of feedback in a system. Let me give you an example of why this is so important. Suppose I were to jump out of a plane without a parachute. My speed would increase and increase continuously till I reached ground level. And not a happy ending and of course not an ending that any parachutist wants to meet. But why does it happen? The reason is if I were to wear a parachute and jump and the parachute opened, then the parachute performs the role of regulating my speed as I drop down towards Mother Earth. So the parachute is the feedback mechanism, is part of the control system that helps me regulate the speed of my jump when I get out of the plane. The first case where I did not have a parachute is not a very interesting system. You have no control over the jump. In the second case, I am hopefully in much more control of the way I land. This is exactly the same in any other system. If the system is open-ended and therefore does not have a feedback control mechanism, the system will do whatever it wants. And you as an engineer or a manager has virtually no control over the system. Whereas if the system were to have some form of feedback mechanism, then you could control the parameters of that feedback loop to control the system and manage the expected outcome. So what we are trying to do in this video is to explain to you why thinking about feedback will help us understand complex systems much more. Systems thinking demands that we talk about interaction between subsystems. We talk about the interrelationships between subsystems and the interdependence between subsystems of this holistic system. This implies that one or more subsystems is providing inputs into one or more other subsystems. Now, when, an, when, a, when a subsystem takes in an input, it has to respond to that input. And therefore, subsystems within a system are having feedback loops which creates stability in the overall system. Secondly, the boundary of the system takes in inputs from the environment and act, it acts upon these environmental factors to again create stability within the overall system. So the feedback that it receives is acted upon by the system to ensure continued stability. That is why feedback is so important in studying systems. For any student of control systems, this diagram would be pretty self-explanatory. You have a reference input into the system. You have an error detector circuitry of some kind that provides an error signal into the control elements. The control elements in turn takes in, manipulates disturbances that are coming, that are being applied upon the system to create an output from the open loop system as feedback. If that feedback loop was missing, it would continue to be an open loop system. For example, in the human body, as fr from the moment of our birth till we reach adulthood, the human body continues to grow. At some stage, certain signals are generated within the human body that stop further growth. Otherwise, each one of us would be growing in size till we die. That's not the way nature has designed us. An example here would be the earth's temperature. We have, that is the topic of the day. We are talking about global warming. Let us look at how mother earth could be talked of as a system and what is the feedback mechanism in this kind of a system. The reference input signal in this case is, is the historical temperature of earth, the average temperature over so many decades. The error signal is the increasing temperature albeit it is increasing by a few points centigrade, but it is increasing. 
The control element is of course the ozone layer. The ozone layer prevents further warming of the atmosphere and therefore of earth. The disturbance is in the form of pollution created by mankind, created by natural events, but there is pollution happening. This disturbance in turn impacts the earth's temperature and the earth's the, on, the only feedback that we can do to, to manage this is to reduce the pollution. And therefore, this can be thought of as a closed loop system. The second example that I want to talk about is in the car, in the case of an automobile. Suppose the reference input is the accelerator position and the error signal is the quantity of petrol consumed by the vehicle. So, as you, as if you press the accelerator further, more petrol is consumed. You take your foot off the accelerator, less petrol gets consumed by the vehicle. The control element is the fuel injection system. This is what actually controls the amount of fuel injected into the cylinders. The disturbance, for example, could be the slope of the road. So, if, this, if the road is sloping upwards, the vehicle automatically slows down. If the ro ro road is sloping downwards, the vehicle would automatically start speeding up. The output would therefore be a change in speed. And the feedback to manage this, to keep this under control, is to readjust the accelerator position. Either press it a little bit more or take your foot off the accelerator. A third example to drive this point home is for example an x-ray dosage in an x-ray machine. The reference input is the x-ray dosage setting. Now remember the x-ray machine operator determines how much x-ray must be given to the human body based on a variety of factors. The size of the person, the age of the person and the particular organ being examined. So the x-ray dosage setting is the reference input. The error signal is the current that flows through the x-ray tube. The higher the current, the more the x-rays that are generated. The control element is the control circuitry that actually controls the amount of current flowing through the tube. The disturbance is the tube temperature. It is a fact, it is just physical law that the x-ray dosage varies with the temperature of the filament in the tube, in the x-ray tube. Therefore, the output is the change in x-ray dosage and of course our feedback must therefore be to change the current that flows through the x-ray tube. In this sense, the whole x-ray machine, the x-ray scanner is a system of its own. So now let us try and understand again the difference between analytical and systemic thinking. Remember, analysis is breaking up of a bigger system into its constituent subsystems and then understanding each of these subsystems. In systems thinking, we are talking about synthesis, about building up a whole overall system by understanding not only the subsystems, but also the interaction between those subsystems. So that was just a reminder of the difference. Now let me give you an example of how to move from analytical thinking to systems thinking. Let us go back to our fishbone diagram that we saw in the earlier video. We talked about the quality of the product. The quality of the product is impacted by the pressure for quality. So if the organization it places a lot of pressure on the quality of deliverables, hopefully the quality of deliverables increases. You reduce the pressure, the quality of deliverables drop. If the fatigue level of the engineers or employees working on the system is high, quality is likely to drop, so on and so forth. This is analytical thinking. Typical fishbone diagram, one of the Six Sigma tools that, that are widely in use is used for analytical thinking. Now let us convert this to systems thinking and see where this takes us. The same example where we are talking about the quality. You see the center bubble here, that is quality. All the black lines on this diagram show you the relationships between the individual subsystems. Remember, a system is interdependent, interrelated and here is an example of relationships between subsystems. What these black lines show is, for example, if the morale is high, the higher the morale, the higher the quality. Higher the morale, higher the quality. The higher the attrition, higher the schedule pressure. 
higher the attrition, higher the fatigue because the remaining team members have to put in that much extra effort to deliver the same result. The higher the pressure for quality, the higher the fatigue. But the higher the pressure for quality, the higher the quality itself. The higher the experience of the team members, higher the quality. The higher the experience of the team members, higher the morale. Now you see, begin to see a pattern of relationships amongst all the subsystems. Now these, the patterns that I have shown on this diagram are what are called direct relationships. If x increases, so does y. There could be inverse relationships. For example, all the red lines on this diagram depict inverse relationships. For example, the schedule pressure, higher the schedule pressure potentially impacting quality. I have to deliver it urgently, I might give quality a go by. On the other hand, higher the pressure on quality, the less I can have schedule pressure. I can't have both. Similarly, higher the attrition, lower the morale. Why is that? The remaining employees are now wondering why we have such a large attrition, is something wrong, is the project going to die, so on and so forth. So this is an inverse relationship. So in the previous diagram, we saw direct relationships between various subsystems, various variables. In this diagram, we are seeing inverse relationships between various variables. As a systems thinker, it is your responsibility to put both these diagrams together and to think of the holistic system, to think of the direct and inverse relationships between these various variables and to see how each of these variables can be managed better through appropriate feedback to manage the quality of the final output in this case. Now remember, each of these variables themselves are feedback mechanisms and it's your responsibility to manage each of these variables appropriately, to, to pay special attention to those variables that have the maximum impact on the system, thus ensuring desired result and stability of the system. I hope these examples and these discussions gave you a feel for what systems thinking is all about. It gave you a feel for the importance of feedback in systems thinking. It gave you an idea of how to look for this feedback and the fact that feedback can result from interaction and the interrelationships between subsystems of a system and the fact that feedback can either be direct or inverse. Thank you very much for watching this video, but I would urge you to go back and do a little bit more reading about control systems and the concept of feedbacks, for that is going to help you build system related diagrams in subsequent modules. Thank you.